What's up, gangsters? It is a tired day, but a good day here at Rube Goldberg Enterprises because this is a project finished day. And this one is another one that's been a long time in the making, uh, almost a year. I, I started this right at the beginning of uh, August of 2017. So, yep, 10 and a half months uh, right at, and it feels good to be done. Um, Anyway, um, if you follow any of my stuff, you may recall that, uh, that last fall I did a uh, part one of a two-part build review thing on the Hasegawa 148th F4E, which I have been uh, building as uh, a QF4E, Q being because um, it's a drone. Um, and... Uh, uh, it's been an adventure, and I'm finally done, and I'm like super wiped out because I've been I've been slamming on it to get it done um, over the last uh, couple of weeks because I'm leaving the day after tomorrow to go to Panama for a month of stem cell treatment. So anyway, I just I, I wanted to leave a clean workbench. I, I just you know wanted to have it all done, and um, and here it is. So. Um, without any further lip flapping on my part, uh, let's take a look at what I managed to accomplish. Okay, so there we go, and here it is. Um, as you can see, I've got it mounted uh, on this base, um, which I think is kind of a cool thing. Um, I, what I did was just uh, got my, I got my local machine shop guys to. Whoops, I'm having a hard time controlling the camera today. Obviously, had my local machine shop guys turn me a chunk of four-inch aluminum bar stock. Um, and, uh, and then I use that uh, 1 8 inch carbon fiber rod um, and that makes a really nice stiff and sturdy mount for it 
um, that is not, at least in my opinion, too objectionable visually. Um, and the base is nice and heavy. I mean, it is never going to tip over, that's for sure. And it's loosely mounted on the rod. It just slides on there so that not only can I spin it around, but if I ever needed to take it off of there for transport or whatever, um, it would be easy enough to do. And we can see the bits of flurm underneath. But you can see that it goes into the belly tank at what is about the center of gravity for the thing. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about close enough, I think. Um, at any rate, that's the base. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the kit itself because um, I, did, uh, I did that pretty exhaustively in the, uh, the first episode. Um, but just to sort of, of summarize, I guess, um, you know, it's a decent kit. It's Hasegawa. It's, a, I think, 15 or 20 years old at this point. Um, it does not have a lot of rivets. Okay, I gotta answer that phone call. Okay, had to take that phone call. That's one of my buddies who's coming to Panama with me. Uh, so anyway, where was I? Um, the talking about the base and uh, all that stuff actually also <laughs> took the opportunity to put a little bit of uh, AK Ultra Matt on a spot of shiny super glue that I saw while I was talking on the phone. Seems like those little sorts of things never end with these projects. There's always something you can keep doing, but at a certain point, you just got to call them done. Anyhow, um, so um, to summarize uh, with the kit, uh, seamless intakes. Uh, here we go with my compressor. It is just that kind of day. I think I'm going to unplug my airbrush. There's something about this Iwata. TRN1, it has developed a slow leak. I don't know what its problem is, but it drives me crazy. So, anyway, since I'm about to be gone for a month, there's no reason for the compressor to be coming on all the time. Anyhow, uh, yet again, back to the subject at hand. <laughs> and I'm tired, and I'm probably pretty incoherent. That's not helping. Anyway, uh, resin intakes... Um, I can't even remember Cutting Edge, I think, is who they're from. Um, anyway, uh, Aries Resin Cockpit Interior, uh, res Aries Resin Nozzles, which were uh, are really beautiful but are an engineering disaster. Um, they're just, they, they don't, there's, they, I mean, there's really nothing inside there anyway um, to mount anything, uh, but, but, the, the Aries parts definitely don't do anything to help you with that. It was a real balancing act to get those things glued in there. Um, the fit on the cockpit stuff was, you know, was really kind of of a hassle. It was very difficult, but uh, overall, I think all those things were worth it. I mean, you can see if you look in there that the, the level of detail is 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 pretty visible. Um, I mean, if it is, if you're at the right angle. So I think those were worth it. And then, of course, the master uh, turned uh, pito tube probe thing, which the camera, of course, is not going to want to focus on. Um, anyway, beautiful little parts. Um, and um, I think that's about it as far as uh, the parts that I bought for it. Um, I made a lot of little greeblies for it. Basically, there's all kinds of details along the spine on the top and the bottom. This little thing here, um, on the nose, that gold thing. Um, almost all of these antennas and sensors, that black football-shaped thing, um, those are all parts that I either scavenged or made myself. Um, there's some little bits here on the, on the wing tips. You can kind of see that I added, there's a, it's just kind of a little boxy thing right there behind that white square and some little gizmos on the trailing edge. And then this stuff here on the tail that is uh, some uh, particular part of 
uh, what makes this uh, a drone um, is is all stuff that I fabricated myself. Not exact, not perfect, um, but enough to I think you know cover the bases. Um, there's some some stuff underneath here. Same thing. More of these little antennas and fins and things. The one thing I did not do. Um, there's a, a a a big chunk of a thing that is right under here in the right hand side missile bay on a QF4 that is the entire remote control box basically it uh, it's basically the how they fly the thing from the ground but and I and I chose not to do it because I just I, I never could find a really good picture of what the thing looked like of course until it was too late I was collecting reference photos on this thing all the way through, and there were a couple of places where I really wished I had found a particular photo sooner because it showed me something that I, I really should have done. Um, but um, I, I, that thing is kind of a weird football-shaped pointy thing that, that fits up in there, and I just didn't have a good idea what it was supposed to look like or how to make it until it was too late, so blew that off. Um, one of the things that, that I talked about in my previous video that really defines the F4 are the um, uh, giant washers that um, festoon the uh, heat shielding in the tail section. And um, I made a tool to create those that uh, mostly turned out good. You can see I got, I got a couple of them there with the spacing a little bit off. But there, I used the uh, molded in detail to uh, as my pattern. Uh, my little tool basically scribes that that circular line and centers off of the rivet that's molded in there already. So, kind of is what it is. Um, my tolerances were a little loose, I guess, and that's why that one is is a little bit uneven. But um, that that's you know for as far as scratch building and resin and all of that. Um, that pretty well covers it. There were a couple of challenges with the kit just because of engineering. Um, these stabilators are just ridiculously poor in terms of, of engineering. Uh, and it's just, I just, a lot of aircraft model makers, model kit manufacturers are, are bad about this, but this is really the worst I've ever seen. All Hasegawa gives you for mounting the stabilators is a little stub that goes into a hole, and that stub is is like um, two millimeters long and maybe a millimeter and a half in diameter, and it's not a tight fit. Uh, it, it's it's just terrible. And so what I did is I I drilled into the fin and added a piece of stainless steel tubing, um, and then drilled a corresponding hole in the fuselage, and that helps. That at least guaranteed that they were both going to be in the same position. Um, but it still wasn't super good. Um, the, I, the one on this side ended up being a tight enough fit that I was able to wick a good amount of, of extra thin into the joint and make it nice and strong. But the one on the left side had a, had a worse gap, and you can kind of see it. And from that angle, if I hadn't fixed it, you'd be able to just about see all the way through it. And it was unsightly. So what I did is I stretched out a piece of sprue and stuffed it in there and then wicked some extra thin in. And that obviously tightened it up and made it a whole bunch stronger. And because I'm a serial over gluer, I also wicked some extra thin cyanoacrylate into it. Um, but you know, by the time I did the washes and everything, uh, you can't even tell. And it, uh, it filled up the gap pretty well. Um, kind of the other thing that bums me out about the kit, not really so much in terms of engineering, because the rest of the kit, you know, really goes together pretty well. Um, but just in terms of, like, detail, quality, is um, some of this undercarriage stuff, these pylons. They're clearly from, like, an old, old tool or something. As you can see, they have raised panel lines on them, and, and really not any detail. Um, and I elected not to fiddle with that and try to make them any better, because honestly, those are not really an important part of the story here. Um, I just, they, you know, they're just kind of placeholders there. Um, oh, I forgot, in looking at the, uh, the Tiseo pod, 
which was you know particular to this variant of of the f4e um, i did add this box right here whatever it is i don't know what it does but it's got to be on there oh and i also forgot of course um, from furball uh, who are well known for their decals i got their photo etched oops don't bang the camera into your freshly finished model there pattison um, anyway um, Furball makes great decals, but they also make these slime light frames, photo etch, and they're very nice. And so I used those as well. You can see another one of those little master turned pieces there. It's this spike right here. I don't know what the heck it does, but it sure is sharp. There is no grabbing onto the model right there after you've done that. Um, one other part of uh, kind of the, you know, that was kind of a fit issue that definitely caused me some drama was with the canopy. And you can see it right there from the correct angle. Um, it does not fit perfectly, and I had to put a lot of force onto it. And um, I had it kind of rough masked uh, at the time because uh, I was still doing body work and priming, spot priming, and I wanted to make sure I didn't obviously get any paint on the, on the clear part. And so I didn't find that until after everything was very firmly glued down and I took that rough masking off uh, to do the real masking. And obviously those are stress fractures uh, from the <laughs> massive clampage that I put on the part. And it's just one of those things where I just had to make a decision immediately. Am I going to live with it or not? Because not meant basically sawing the canopy off ordering another kit and replacing it with another part that might not fit any better. So, you know, that that's a disappointment, but it is what it is. The other bit of drama that I had, um, <laughs> and this was definitely a bit of drama, um, was also involving the canopy. Because when I pulled the rough masking off, I discovered that even though I thought I had done a pretty good job of of sealing all of this cockpit stuff off on the inside, I had an absolute shit ton of swarf and flurm in there from all of my sanding and drilling and grinding on these intakes and other things. I mean, it was bad. It was really bad. And uh, <laughs> getting most of that stuff out was a real adventure. And you can see, I did not get all of it out. There's a chunk of it right there on the dashboard. You can see it. <laughs> and that's just another thing that I have to live with uh, for as long as I you know, have this model on my shelf. Um, <laughs> but what I had to do to get the other 95% of it out of there was, um, I, at first I drilled a hole up. I did, I, fortunately, I did not have the, uh, the nose gear door on yet. So I drilled a hole through the floor of the fuselage where it couldn't be seen. I mean, through the floor of the cockpit where it couldn't be seen. And I used canned air. I stuck the straw in there and blew a couple of hard blasts. And that at least got the stuff circulating enough to where um, it actually, a lot of it came out. Um, but at least got most of it off of the, of, the, of the glass. You can still see there's one little piece right there in front of... Captain Paul E. Styrene. Uh, but anyway, I didn't get all of it out. And so then um, I was like, well, now what? So I figured maybe I can put a wire in there and hook some of it and knock it loose because I still had pieces up inside here. So I drilled a very tiny hole right here in the edge of the canopy glass <laughs> and snaked a, a wire in there. And I was, able to ma I was able to knock two or three more pieces of it loose, but still not all of it. <laughs> so at that point, it was like Hail Mary. So I flipped the thing over on its back and used the hole that I had drilled in the bottom to, get ready for this, fill it full of water. <laughs> and I did that probably a dozen times. I mean, I spent like two or three hours on this one day where I had the cockpit half full of water and I was shaking this thing like a tambourine to try and wash the pieces of flurm out of this area up here and get them at least down into the floor of the cockpit where they wouldn't be seen. 
and it was surprisingly effective and penalty free uh, and, and part of the reason why I knew I could get away with it was because everything inside as is my custom was sealed with a nice layer of aqua gloss and then a nice layer of dull coat um, after all of the painting and weathering inside was done. So I knew that the water was not going to affect anything inside there um, as long as it wasn't, you know, soaking in there for, for a decade. Uh, my major fear was that I was going to have big water spots on the inside of the, uh, of, the, of the canopy. And fortunately, that turned out not to be the case. Um, you know, I just have that giant stress fracture <laughs> and the little bits of phlegm. So, but hey, look, it is what it is. I mean, there's a certain point where you just got to go, okay, and accept your penalty um, and, and learn from it. And uh, yeah, so next time I do something like this, I will definitely be taking extreme measures to make sure that nothing gets inside there. Um, I mean, I could have used a different strategy. I could have left the, uh, the canopy off longer, um, but I just I, I wanted to make sure that everything was protected. And, um, and so, you know, it is what it is. I also did not realize until later that I was going to end up removing this intake over here and uh, that involves some grinding and refitting it because after it was all put together, I discovered when looking at it from the front that this intake was way lower than the other one. I mean, it was unsightly. I, you could see it from a mile away. So I had to do some grinding up inside there and pop this intake off and do a bunch of work on this joint right here to get the thing to line up properly. And uh, I'm actually pretty pleased that that did not turn out any worse than it did. So anyway, other than those things, <laughs> other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Um, anyway, you know, other than that stuff, there was no really major drama or trauma with the thing. It was just a lot of work. I, I did a lot of scribing. I, I riveted the entire thing, um, some of which got lost with all the painting in it and so forth, but hopefully you'll be able to see some of it. Um, so it, it was just a lot, a lot of work uh, to get to the point where I had this canvas that I could try and realize my my artistic vision on the paint and the weathering um and um that was that was a pretty intense effort and i and i, and I was getting into some things that i had not done before um one of my well let me first i guess just just kind of start at the bottom um it, it's basically black based like pretty much everything i'm i'm doing these days um but with my pattern layers um, which a lot of, you know, people call the marble layer, you know, whatever you want to call it. What I have started doing is using these things. Let me grab this. These things are super cool. This is a template from a little company uh, called Art Tool, and they make these uh, texture stencils. And they are fantastic for producing these sort of random uh, patterns which I like because when you do all of your black basing uh, with an airbrush, depending obviously on how much you blend it, it can tend to look like it was airbrushed. And a lot of times the way that paint fades and degrades is that you get more sharp edged uh, gradations or var variegations, whatever you want to call them, uh, in the paint. And so I like these because I can get some, some of that harder edged look. But I also combine it with some softer edged airbrush stuff. The bottom line is, is to get a randomness over the whole thing and not have the entire airframe look like it was marble coated. Um, these, are, these are cheap. Like you get three of them for, I think, 15 or 20 bucks. But you can see they're a little bit flimsy. I've been using the shit out of these and they're starting to fall apart. I hear that uh, Ushi van der Rossen is making some photo etch ones, which will be much better because they'll be steel and uh, obviously a lot more durable and you can you know, use lacquer thinner to wash the paint off of them or whatever. So uh, anyway, that's how I do my, my, mar my, my pattern layers. Um, 
And um, one thing that I've definitely started doing is I'm, I'm not doing just one. Um, you know, kind of the standard black basing method is you do your marble, you do your, you do your marble coat, and then you do your blend layer. And I, that's that's for me proven to not be anywhere close to enough. So I end up doing several different pattern layers, um, and I I may do a couple of pattern layers with the the stencils. I may do a pattern layer with sponge chipping. That works pretty good. Um, I use this um, liquid frisket, which is uh, I like it because it's nice and thin, and so when you um, when you use it with a sponge, um, you can get a lot of variety in the sizes and shapes of, of the splotches, and you can get them down to where they're they're pretty small. Um, and uh, in fact, that's how I did the uh, chipping on this piece underneath the nose right there because I just needed it to be quick and, and simple and hairspray wasn't really that not that necessary for it. But speaking of hairspray, I did do a lot of hairspray on this thing um, and I and I, I did I, I did do one of my pattern layers that way I believe if I remember right. At any rate, um, as I work my way up in that layer stack, I, I go from darker to lighter. That's kind of proven to be a sort of a formula that works well for me. So that by the time I get to the very top of it, I'm, I'm at that faded paint look that I want and the tonality that I want. And I've got lots of little bits of darker stuff showing through. And you can kind of see some of that, some of that there. Um, and for me, that 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 gives me the uh, gives me the magic that I'm after. Um, I also, in addition to uh, doing uh, doing that uh, uh, kind of uh, what's what am I looking for? I've lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, that's that's the basic paintwork. Um, it's all and it's all MRP lacquer, um, with the exception of the orange stuff. The orange stuff is actually Mr. Color lacquer, um, but I think I mixed it with some MRP yellow to get the or no, it's 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 Guns Mr. Color red that I mixed with MRP yellow to get the orange that I wanted, um, and I, and I got kind of lucky on that because if you look. You can very distinctly see the riveting pattern in that, and I'm this. I got to figure out how to make this happen again because basically what happened is the chipping on this was very hard. I ended up using a toothbrush on it. Um, it is hairspray chipping, by the way, and uh, um, I was doing it just as to get another another pattern layer um, and uncover some of the darker orange underneath. But what happened was, is that because of all the, uh, because the plastic is a little bit pooched up around all of those rivets, the paint came off of those more easily than it did everywhere else. And so it uncovered all of my hard riveting work that I had done. And I was just, I just was super stoked about the way that turned out. It's one of my favorite things about this whole project. And it's just, you know, it's kind of a happy accident. Um, I hope that I can duplicate it again. Um, we'll see. I, I kind of feel like that that Mr. Color Lacquer is a little harder to chip than MRP. Um, but regardless, my basic formula for you guys that, that are wondering, you know, how to chip MRP, because it can be difficult. There's kind of a tipping point between two and three layers where it gets thick enough and shiny enough that it, that it will resist chipping efforts. Um, and so, kind of my formula is that basically, um, I, I, I lay the hairspray down, and I do like two layers. You don't want too much, uh, but I, I decant it and I spray it through my airbrush because I just cannot get the right amount of control doing it from the can. So, I spray it out of my airbrush I get until I get a nice, even sheen that tells me I've got two solid layers, and then I shoot the color coat, and I start chipping as soon as my airbrush is clean. 
that's how I time it. And whatever that is, five minutes, I don't know. But that's when I start the chipping. And I start with the softest, with a soft brush. And if that doesn't work, then I go up to something more difficult. And, um, you know, I end up, I mean, I may end up using, like I said, something as, as gnarly as a toothbrush, like I did on, uh, on these wings, winglets. Um, but, you know, you, chipping is alchemy, and you just kind of have to feel your way through it. Um, one thing that was nice that I discovered is that as I was doing all of this oil work to create the, the seepage stage, which I'll talk about in a minute, I lost the subtlety of a lot of this chipping. A lot of the really small chips were disappearing on me. And at that point, I already had um, a, a layer of uh, dull coat on there. And uh, not even sure I still had any hairspray left on any of those of those areas that had already been chipped. But I decided to go ahead and try chipping again, and it worked just fine. And this was like two or three weeks after um, all of that chipping had initially been done. And, uh, you know, the dull coat had been dry for probably a week. So I was able to re-chip some of those areas and recover some of those uh, little tiny chips and really kind of bring it back into shape. So that's a good thing to know. Um, I think MRP definitely gets harder to chip after about that half hour point, but you can still do it. Uh, and that's just, that's comforting to know that. So uh, once I had all of the uh, basic um, uh, pattern that I wanted or, or, or the look that I wanted, with what ended up probably being a half dozen uh, pattern and blend layers. Um, then it was time to start actually working on wearing some of the paint. Um, and I also at that point had masked off what was left of these black stripes uh, up here on top of the intakes. And um, so then I got after it with a uh, with a UMP uh, buffing stick. And this has become one of my favorite paint wear techniques because we all know that paint does not always just chip. Uh, sometimes it fades and, and erodes and gets wind burned and, and whatever. And the look of that is very different from chipping. And so what you need is a way to kind of just, you know, replicate that process where you can basically thin the paint down in a kind of a random way that, 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 that looks natural. And Rinaldi talks about doing it with Windex or with thinner, and I've tried that, and it gets a little bit sketchy and you still end up with some things that look more like chipping. But what I have discovered is this uh, Ultimate uh, Modeling Products green uh, buffing stick, this is the magic business uh, because it will very gradually basically sand the paint away and it gives you this real nice random sort of faded out look uh, and I, I just love that I, I mean it, I just I think that looks supernatural and super natural and it's easy to do you can, it can get away from you you can go through the, the through to your primer quicker than you might imagine if you're not careful but even then, sometimes it works. I mean, right here, I, I did it because the real aircraft has, for whatever reason, this sort of pattern of three stripes right there. And so that's what I did. I used the edge of this green stick to go all the way, you know, not, not totally all the way through, but enough to allow that, uh, that primer to show up underneath there. Okay, so uh, that got me to the point where I had all of what I call the basic paint work, paint work done. In other words, I had all my colors on and all of the weathering that was going to be built into the paint uh, was done. Um, and it was time to uh, start on the panel lines, uh, which I did with, with oils um, and mineral spirits. Um, and I did all of that directly on the paint, as I usually do, uh, because especially with MRP being a little bit glossy, the washes flow really well, and there's just no need to add another another clear coat. So I did all the panel lines that I that I uh, that I wanted to do. Uh, I did all of them basically, except um, 
I didn't do where they were really heavy like that. That was going to come later. So anyway, I did all the washes, and then I put on a nice solid layer of dull coat on the whole thing to lock all that in and separate uh, all of that work that was going to uh, from what was going to come next, which was all of the oil work. And this is where I really got into unknown territory because trying to figure out how to replicate uh, the look of this seepage, um, I had not, you know, I hadn't really tried it before. And, I, you know, this is, this is a phenomenon that you can see on a lot of, uh, of modern jets, um, particularly like the Hellenic Air Force uh, A7s and their F4s. You see this a lot, and there's a lot of debate about what causes it. I personally think it's just jet fuel and, you know, how it how it leaks and weeps all over the place like this is anybody's guess, but the fact is it does. And, uh, you know, it, it affects the paint in a, in a very characteristic way. And there's probably other ways that you could have done this, but in my mind they all involved uh, a penalty. Um, I was not confident enough in my airbrush skills, particularly where you have those kind of pointy areas around the uh, rivets that I could do that even with something like a Sotar where you can, can really airbrush down small. Um, I'm just not that good with it. I know there are people out there who are, but I'm not one of them. And so I felt like oils was really the right way to go. And so all of that dark gray staining is, uh, is oil work. And then of course, uh, you know, the simple and obvious stuff like the dirt around the, the, the cockpit where the boarding ladder goes and um, all of this stuff uh, back here on the tail section with, uh, you know, where the, the metal is burnt uh, from the exhaust and um, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, same thing on the, on the cans, all of that. Um, was uh, was oil work. So, uh, and, and again, you know, I'm not, I, I could go on and on about how I do all of it, but the bottom line with oils is that you have a lot of power because um, you've got this, this opacity range that goes from straight out of the tube to super, super thin like a filter. And you can do all of that on the fly. Um, like, for example, I could use uh, paint with just a little bit of thinner in it to, on a very small brush to go along and do this super thick and gross panel line that, you know, has some kind of sealer on it or whatever. Or I could use uh, really thin washes to create staining like I did uh, here around the, uh, the stabilator pivots. Um, or I could use it straight out of the tube like I did to try and replicate where um, in the photos I have it shows that there's a lot of sealant, I guess it is, basically looks like bathroom caulk that's gooped around that, that black uh, football shaped thing. So that was oil that was basically straight out of the tube to do that. Um, and then, uh, you know, I used oils in various thicknesses to do all of this dark gray staining. Um, some of it I put on straight out of the tube and then worked it in and then wiped it off and then came back and, and used thinner stuff with a slightly different tone to it in different areas to just get some variety. Um, and, and, and that's all I can really say about that because it really was almost a trial and error process of, of, of getting it to the look that I wanted. And it, and it was a lot of work. Um, the right hand side was less work because I, I kind of had a little bit of a method figured out after doing all of this over here. But it's just, you know, it's just, it's just getting after it. And, and uh, that's, that's the other thing I love about oils is that um, y y you, d you really just have to get into it and figure out what's going to work. I have particular tools and, and kind of methods that work for me, but that certainly doesn't mean that they're the only ones. Like this brush right here, this Low and Cornell uh, number two ultra round, for me, this thing is a power tool. You can see what a super fine point it gets on it. And so it works great for real precise 
placement of washes and, and stains. Um, but I also use this Windsor & Newton uh, Triple-Ot miniature. And the thing to know is that the miniature series, uh, series set, the miniature version of the Series 7 has these short bristles. Um, the regular Series 7 are longer. And I think most figure painters prefer those because they want the belly of the brush to hold more paint. But with oils, you don't need that. All you need is a tiny, tiny bit on the very, very tip of the brush to do the work. And so I like that uh, the miniature version of the Series 7 because the short bristles give me uh, give me better control. I gotta plug my battery in here. Um, anyway, um, so I can tell you things like that, but beyond that, it's really difficult for me to say, do it exactly this way. I get a lot of guys asking me, you know, how do you do this oil work stuff? I, look, I, I don't know what more to tell you than that. Um, I can tell you the tools I use and the materials I use and kind of the br basics of the method. But for me, what happens is it doesn't really, I don't really figure it out until I'm in the middle of it and I'm doing it. And it may not work the first time. I can tell you that I did the bottom, which you can't really see that well. I did the whole bottom section underneath here three times. Uh, the first two times, I didn't like it. And uh, I just took a, uh, took a little rag with some mineral spirits on it and just washed it right off. Um, and in one case, it was like a day later. Then the third time, it was because <laughs> the guys on SMCG didn't like it. And I agreed with them. Um, I had some streaking underneath that just really was too heavy-handed. It, it wasn't really good uh, storytelling. It wasn't really representative of, of the real thing. And so, and I had already locked that in with dull coat. And so I sanded it a little bit to thin the dull coat and then got after it again with just some mineral spirits and uh, I scrubbed it off. And this was def this was like 24 hours later. Scrubbed it off and redid it. Um, and so, you know, that's the thing that's, that's awesome about oils is you just about cannot screw it up because you have so much ability to, to erase it and start over. And, um, uh, you know, and that's even on top of a very flat surface. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, should you use gloss or semi-gloss or flat? Um, and I think the only really wrong answer is a gloss surface. Oils just do not want to play with a gloss surface. They have to have something to get a good grip on. Um, you, you've got to have some traction. And I ran into that in a spot right here where I had uh, a big thumbprint right there. Um, that I guess got burned in there when my dull coat wasn't completely dry and I'd grabbed onto the model or something. I mean, with lacquers, you can normally grab them, you know, within a couple of minutes as long as you don't, you know, like really hold your finger in a certain spot. And I guess I did because I had a big thumbprint right here that I didn't discover until I started brushing uh, dark colored paint over the top of it. And then I was like, oh, holy shit, that's not good. So I sanded it off and I didn't bother to reapply the dull coat right there. And so it was a little shinier right in this area and I could not get the oils to stick right there to save my life. So whatever you do, you know, if you wanna work on top of a satin finish, fine, that, that, should, that should be okay. I prefer to work on top of a fully flat finish. Uh, to me, that is the best canvas for, for the oil work. Um, but whatever you do, don't try to do it on top of a gloss finish. It's just not going to go well. You will have a bad time. Speaking of gloss finishes, there are zero on this uh, on this thing, except in a couple of spots, which I'll talk about. Um, I did not do my customary layer of aqua gloss over the top of all the oil work to seal and protect it because I knew that I didn't have much handling uh, to go uh, after I finished all of that. If I'm in a situation where I have a lot of assembly work and a lot of handling that I need to do after the paint and the weathering is finished, then I like a layer of aqua gloss because I know it's bulletproof and it will totally seal and protect it. And then I'll flatten that as my last layer. But I don't want to use any more clear coats than I have to. And so with this one, 
it's two layers of dull coat is basically the, all that's on there. Like I said, one on top of the paint after I did the panel line washes, and then one on top of everything after I did all the oil weathering. Now, there are a couple of places where there are, where there is some very localized gloss. And one of them is right here. Maybe you'll be able to see it if I swivel the camera a little bit. You can see that there is, if it'll focus, some stenciling right there. Um, and this is also one of those places where I've got a much better reference photo from my buddy Chris Course um, after the fact, uh, of course, when it was too late. Um, because at the time, I didn't really know what all that stenciling said. My reference photo just didn't show it clearly enough. And so what I did is I cut up a little bit of, uh, you know, some little bitty tiny stencils and uh, to just make it look believable from, you know, from a decal sheet, obviously, and put them on there. I also used a 0 0.05 millimeter uh, archival ink pen to just handwrite some, some numbers and, and things on there. But anyway, the point is, I had some little decals there. I also had, uh, I have a decal over here. Uh, in my reference photos, there is a, a group insignia right there that is way faded and, and worn and, and, and really isn't legible, but you can clearly identify it as a group insignia. And I really wanted that feature in the paint. Uh, and so after lots of debate about how to get it done, I uh, printed a decal of my own off of a, of a JPEG that I found on the internet, um, or rather somebody on SMCG found for me because I was like, hey, can you guys look at this picture and tell me what you think it is? Because in my reference photo, it's not very clear. Um, anyway, I printed a decal and put it on there and then sanded it, let it get kind of worn down looking. And uh, then on both places where I have decals, obviously I was going to have edges that I did not want. So I used some old uh, testers gloss coat, which is just clear gloss lacquer, and spot varnished all around those decals and built it up and sanded it down and built it up and sanded it down. And I think it took three, three passes to completely smooth out those decal edges and make them disappear. But that's the technique. That's what you do. If you got to make a decal edge go away, uh, that's how you do it. And so I think it worked pretty good because what I ended up with was a pretty shitty looking decal that once I did my blend layer, because um, this was after a couple of pattern layers and before several blend layers that I put this thing on here. Um, I think, that, you know, I ended up with a fairly authentic looking representation of that uh, worn and faded uh, insignia. So anyway, that's pretty much everything with the paint and weathering challenges except for one thing. And that was these numbers that are on the nose and um, back here next to the engines and then on the tail. Um, had to figure out what to do about those because I did not want decals. Um, I did not want to have to deal with with all of that spot varnishing and blending on all of those places. But getting masks cut was not going to work. I talked to several people and it just wasn't going to be possible because, um, and you can see it pretty clearly on these this, this, this one here, the numbers are just too damn small and where you've got those hangers that uh, like get you the uh, the middle of the six and the middle of the A, and then the middle of the fours and the P. Um, it's just too small. Vinyl won't do it. And so um, I used a place that another SMCG guy recommended to me, Brian Banna. He's a railroad modeler, but he's a fantastic builder, and he's also got a good YouTube channel. Um, he does a lot of custom photo etch that he designs himself. And uh, he uses a place in the UK. And of course, now I cannot remember it. Hold on, I'll look on my phone. Maybe I can dial it up right here uh, while I'm. Uh, what the heck was the name of that place? Okay, I got it. I had to do a little bit of searching there, but they're called PPD, and they're in the UK, and they are super cool, super easy to deal with. 
Um, you send them a, uh, an Adobe Illustrator file if you know how to use that. Um, and you can design your own and uh, they will get you a quote back pretty quick. You can also just send them a JPEG and they'll do the design work for you, but you have to pay a little bit for that, obviously. Anyway, PPD was awesome. They ended up charging me about 50 bucks. It took me about three weeks to get them. Um, but the, uh, the stencils are fantastic. And actually here, I can show you what they look like. Uh, I ordered one set and they sent me two just so I'd have, uh, have an extra. And this is what you get. You put your name on them. <laughs> but you can see, I mean, the, de the level of detail that they can give you is extremely fine. Um, and uh, these, I think, the these are 0.15 millimeter brass. Brian told me after the fact that I could have gotten them even thinner, and that would have made it even easier. Um, I didn't have a huge curve to try and wrap them around here, and obviously I was able to get them to conform tightly enough even for that um, but uh, if I had if I had gone with the next thinner shim stock then they would have been even easier to work with so I was super pleased with that solution because even though again it was expensive I mean you know I know some of you guys are like what you spent 50 bucks just to paint um, what is it uh, one two three four eight numbers on on your model well yeah because there just was not any other way to get it done in, and make it look realistic. Especially given that part of my, my plan involved that uh, uh, sanding trick that I was talking about to make some of the numbers, you can see right there, look old and faded the way that they are on my photo reference. So decal just was not going to be as effective for that. I would have painted this thing if there'd been a way, uh, but that just wasn't happening. So, you know, it's all about finding the solution that's most effective. There is no, typically no single best way to do any of this stuff. You know, you just have to kind of think through everything that you know in your experience and hopefully use good judgment to pick the, the path that is going to be the most effective, that has the fewest risks, and will give you the best results. So anyway, hopefully that's a, a, a good description of everything that I've done here. It's stretched out over the course of nearly a year, like I said, and so I don't remember every single thing, but I think that pretty well captures most of it. Okay, so there you go. That's the thing, um, and a little bit about uh, how I did it. Um, it I, what what are my overall sort of feelings about this project? Um, I, I, I think it was a really good exercise for me because not only had I not ever done a modern jet before, but I had never done the full resin thing before. Um, and I even didn't really do it on this one because I didn't have any wheelbase uh, or, or landing gear to account for. But it was still a really good experience with all of that. Um, you know, just kind of dealing with the fit and finish of... of um, you know, low production resin parts and making all of that stuff work. Was it worth it? Eh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, the cockpit is pretty visible even with the, the lid shut. So I think those details in there are, are good. The nozzles are certainly beautiful. Um, so I would definitely recommend those. The seamless intakes, eh, I don't know. I mean, those ended up being a giant hassle. Um, and I just, you know, unless you shine a flashlight inside there, you're not going to really know about it. And there are other ways of taking care of seams on the insides of intakes. But anyway, I kind of had to do it. It's kind of the done thing with, with uh, these jet models. And so I wanted to uh, see what all the fuss was about. It did end up being a very expensive project. Um, the kit was about 50 bucks. The... Uh, Intakes were about another 50 or 60 bucks. Same thing for the cockpit, the nozzles, I forget how much they were, like 20 bucks or something. The uh, turned brass parts for Master were another 10 bucks. Um, the uh, photo etch uh, stencils that I had made were 50 or 60 bucks. So I wasn't doing the math while I was rattling all that off, but I think I have probably like 300 bucks. <laughs> 
in this thing, especially if you include paint and all that stuff. Um, and, but hey, it, it is what it is. I, you know, I kind of knew going in it was going to be expensive, um, and that honestly was part of why I drove myself so hard to try and realize a very complex uh, sort of vision for this thing. So, anyway, dude, seriously, thank you. Anyway, the compressor obviously does not agree. So anyway, yeah, it was expensive, uh, but this is one that I feel like I can I can be proud of. Um, is it exactly like the photo reference? No, but uh, I feel like it's it's pretty close, uh, close enough, and uh, I feel like the places where I added some drama of my own were were good decisions. So anyway, I'll be interested to see what you guys think. Uh, at any rate, I appreciate you checking it out, uh, and as always. Much love.